ora, kia ora. Um, welcome to episode two of What a Load of Colony, The Conspiracy Files. Uh, tonight we are going to be continuing our discussion around the world of rabbit hole logic or conspiracy theories, as they're also called. Um, and uh, last episode, we spoke about um, who were the architects, who are some of the historical figures in the growth of the misinformation and disinformation movement. Um, and we touched on people like Sun Tzu, uh, Hitler, um, Bill Cooper, very important person to know in this story. Uh, Alex Jones, Donald Trump, no less, and um, his sidekick Steve Bannon. Um, and uh, Q of QAnon. And spoke about their similarities, their traits, um, and and their lives and what they did and how they contributed to the misinformation, disinformation sphere. Tonight, uh, we are going to talk about the culture of misinformation and disinformation. What is the cultural soil, the seedbed that's been laid out for us to um, plant seeds of misinformation and disinformation and have them take root so fast um and so i think probably a good space for us to start is looking at the information age we want to look at you know what's changed particularly over the previous few decades um and so we are going to talk uh, a little bit later in the series about the way in which our tipuna approached knowledge and information and information transmission um, and enlightenment. Um, and so certainly, you know, in Aotearoa and across the Mwananui Akiwa, we had really particular ways of approaching knowledge yeah, we we had Tiko Wairunga Metiko Wairaru, the realm of celestial knowledge, I guess it's loosely translated as, and terrestrial knowledge. Um, not easy things to translate, but there are some kind of core concepts that we held, which was that, you know, the ascent of knowledge <clears throat> it was something that was done um, very purposefully, very deliberately, in a supported fashion. You had people around you who you could trust uh, and you earned your way and you worked your way up to the different levels. And, and you know, we have our tukutuku panels, our tāniko patterns of pōtama that relate to the ascent of, of knowledge. We have our stories about you know, uh, Dane Te Wānanga and his ascent up through the various levels um, to acquire the baskets of knowledge. We had um, our Wānanga systems, you know, and, and as I said, they existed across Te Mananui Akiwa and our tipuna would travel as far as Tapu Tapu Atea, Rai Atea, um, to uh, participate in wānanga there. Um, and and we have many famous wānanga, we had famous wānanga around the country, around the motu that people would go to. And of course that was disrupted through the Tohunga Suppression Act. Um, but we did have, you know, we've always had a very rigorous intellectual tradition of interrogating knowledge and the ascent through the levels of knowledge 
is something that would be managed and supported. Um, but even, you know, I, I think with, with, and I, I, I don't want to say we didn't have written word. We had carved word. We had, you know, woven word. We had all kinds of different ways of recording and um, preserving information and telling stories. Um, you know, just not, not just storytelling, but passing on science, passing on, you know, transmitting knowledge and truth and wisdom and, and, and our science. And so, you know, we did have our own way of recording information, but also uh, with the arrival of um, colonizers and colonization came different approaches to knowledge um, and and so you know I think that was just much more of an open slather <laughs> really they took the knowledge that they that they wanted that they desired they also placed their lens over it and they put it in their books and it, and just had it open to the world without any form of protection or support wrapped around it to help it be well understood, to help it um, sit within its appropriate context. You know, none of that was, was done with that, with that information. So, um, you know, I think just even the, like everything, every part of our existence, our approach to knowledge acquisition and transmission was turned upside down through colonization. Um, and and then, you know, we had the, the industrial age, the industrial era. Um, and then, you know, with the advent of the internet, that changed things again but you know from the industrial era universities the way in which we acquired and passed on information was largely through schools information was stored in books um, we had computers but there was no way that they had the capacity to be able to store information uh, the way that they do now um, information was also transmitted through um, you know, broadcasting, there's television and radio, but those things were able to be tightly controlled for better or for worse. And of course, along with corruption, um, many of those things were taken advantage of. Uh, but there were public broadcasting channels and um, and even, you know, the morals of the stories that were told through Hollywood and through mass media, those things belonged within, you know, very tightly controlled groups. And so the way in which people would be able to access information um, was constrained by uh, economy, um, literacy, as well, your ability, you know, just whether or not you could read a book, um, your access to whether or not you had a television or, you know, had to pay your television fees. You remember what it was like? You had to pay television fees. Yeah, and, and otherwise you had your public broadcasting channels as well. Um, and so, you know, our, our information scape was really restricted. And then with the advent of the internet, it kind of blew everything out. And then again, with the advent of social media, it blew everything out again. And so, you know, looking at the way in which information, um, the transmission and growth and storage of information grew over that time is a pretty fundamental part of understanding um, what created the what created the the cultural soil now just to give you guys some figures like there's some 
pretty mind-blowing figures about understanding the way in which our information scape has grown over the past few years um, or the past couple of decades. If we were to look back at now a terabyte, if we say a terabyte, you know, most people have seen these before. It's one of those little external hard drives that we might empty everything on our laptop into. You can probably store a couple of laptops worth of info on these. Um, so that's a terabyte. Um, and an exabyte, which is what I'm going to be talking about first, which is the, the unit that I'll start with, is a thousand of these. And so, you know, our ability, the, the information that was being transmitted um, and sent around in the 80s was about 432,000 of these, 432 exabytes, so 432,000 um, terabytes is around about what the internet could handle in uh, 1986, or that was the world, sorry, that was the world's technological capacity to be able to transmit information. Um, and in, uh, in 1993, so that was in 1986, we were at, um, sorry, I need to shift that. <laughs> So, so if we start with one of these, this is a terabyte. Most people would know it. You empty your laptop into it when everything gets a bit um, full, or you empty your phone into it as well. And uh, that's one terabyte, right? You can usually get a couple of laptops worth of information into this. So... Um, an exabyte, which is the unit that I'm going to be talking about first, um, is about 1,000 of these. 1,000. Um, and so the whole world's capacity to be able to receive and store information in... Um, 1986 was around about 432,000 of these, 432,000 terabytes or 432 exabytes. Um, and that went up to 715 exabytes in 1993. So that's a bit of an increase. And then within seven years, it went up to 1.2 zettabytes. Now, a zettabyte is a billion of these. So that's like, whoa, that's the climb. It went from 715,000 of these 715 exabytes or 715,000 terabytes up to 1.2 billion terabytes in 2000 and about 2 billion in 2007 and so by that point by 2010 you're looking at the equivalent of about 174 newspapers per person per day traveling around, traveling around the internet. Can you imagine every single person on this planet reading 174 newspapers a day, every day? So, and, and what I'm getting at is that this is how much information we went from taking in beforehand. You know, you might read a book. Not a, often you would read a book in a day. Not even often would you read a newspaper a day. Um, you might read a couple a week. 
the amount of information that was flying around was the equivalent in 2010. And look at the growth it was back then. I don't have the figures for what it is now. But it went up to 2 billion, 2 billion terabytes, 174 newspapers per person per day. And that's just transmission, you know, um, in terms of our ability to store the information. By 2014, we were at over 5 billion um, terabytes of information being stored around. Now, that's the equivalent. If you took 4,500 books, I like, sorry, 4,500 stacks of books that reached from here, the earth to the sun. Not one stack of books from the earth to the sun, not two, not ten, not a hundred. 4,500 stacks of books from Earth to the Sun. That's how much information was being stored in 2014. And when you look at the trajectory of how much everything was increasing from then to now, I'd love to see the figures of what it is now, but I, I don't know what they are. But it would be pretty scary. So that's pretty mind-blowing, the amount of information that's flowing around now, as opposed to then. You know, we've got over 600 websites being developed on the internet every minute and like a, a, a basic telephone oh, I went to look for my phone and it's oh, it's you you're my phone um but my phone that I'm recording myself on now would have been the most powerful computer in the world if I took it back to 1985. Technology has advanced huge amounts, huge amounts. And, um, and also not just the amount of information, but the way in which you can access that information now too. So, you know, whereas before you would be reading books and you would go to university or you would go to a library, now... You can access that information on your phone, on a computer, as well as, you know, there are still the other the other um, options as well. But there's, you know, even in terms of the format of the information, you can, you don't have to have that same level of literacy uh, to be able to acquire information. Not all of it is good information, mind you, but, you know, there's 72 hours of video being uploaded to YouTube every single minute. 72 hours of YouTube video uploaded every minute. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information flying around out there that that wasn't the case before. Um, and it's pretty much open slather. But like I said, not all of it's good information. Some of it's bad information. And bad information... You know, information has value now, too. Um, the White House recently, I read, they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars into data projects. Steve Newcomb, really interestingly, like for those who aren't aware, I've done a lot of research and I did my master's on the doctrine of discovery, um, uh, which is without getting too far into it, essentially a set, it's an international legal concept born out of a set of papal laws from the 14th, 15th century that legitimised the growth of the European Empire and the age of genocide and the disposition of indigenous peoples around the world. Now, one of the leading international scholars around the doctrine of discovery is Steve Newcomb amazing man if you get a chance to read um pagans in the promised land which is his book about the doctrine of discovery i would definitely read it um and he is really clear that the new battleground for the doctrine of discovery which never went away it was incepted by these papal laws but it's still in play today and the new battleground for it is data 
and the information scape so fascinating when he said i asked him i was like where do you see the most important points for us to be focusing our energies now he said i'll be keeping an eye on data and and when you look at this you know it makes sense i mean anywhere there's money and power that's where you're going to see um imperialists making power grabs and resource grabs and money grabs and as far as the value of data i've got some figures here poor data um across businesses and government cost the u.s economy alone 3.1 trillion dollars a year from bad data and accessing just 10 percent more quality data for your business for large-scale corporations can increase their income by 65.7 million dollars a year for an average fortune 1000 company so data matters and it, and it's um you know it's but but it also it creates meaning right it it's creating meaning even out of thin air and um people are now establishing relationships online and you put your bank did you do your banking online you do yeah you know, a lot of people live their lives online and especially now in the age of covid you know more than ever people are relying on the internet um to be able to stay at home safely and do things so and i guess you know if you want to talk if to come back to the idea of rabbit hole logic and conspiracy theories there are conspiracy theories that say that COVID is a hoax and it's all about keeping people at home and on the internet and uh I find that ironic because the internet is largely where many of these conspiracy theories are born and thrive and, and they don't exist very far outside of the internet. Um, but, you know, I think in order to accept that, you have to accept that there are people out there creating huge lies when they say that they're, you know, creating death figures out of thin air and and taking footage of people dying and being buried out of thin air. And, you know, we have our indigenous networks that are reporting back to us about high death rates, high mortality rates as well. So for those of us in Aotearoa who don't believe that that's particularly true, I think that's quite insulting to indigenous brothers and sisters um, and what they're going through. And... We are, I think, fortunate at the moment that we have not been struck as hard as, as some of our Indigenous brothers and sisters around the world. But if we continue to ignore the warnings and the good information, then that luck may just run out. So anyway, um, like I said, a lot of information flying around at the moment. Um, and and that and it's boomed right and we haven't really maintained those tikanga around you know supporting our journey through the acquisition of information and the transmission of information um it's kind of now just this open slather free for all um and so you know, there are discussions around, you know, how do we actually slow down on the information that we are acquiring and start to process it ourselves and put it through some of our own rigorous interrogation. I call it putting checkpoints, intellectual checkpoints up to interrogate what passengers might be being brought into your mind and into your reasoning um, that might not be from from here from you from where you were from anyway so that's you know that's one aspect of it um and certainly you know when um a huge part of a you know one of those huge um growth spurts in the transmission and storage capacity of the internet and the transmission of information happened with the advent of social media 
in the early 2000s, Twitter and Facebook really taking off and, and information just started to um, fly pretty loose and fast from that point. Not all of it good. Uh, but also, you know, we have um, over these periods as well, the growth of um, incel culture, well, gaming culture, um, where on particularly particularly online gaming and so online gaming communities you have the incel culture which is associated to that now you know the the online gaming communities are you know there's some good peeps in there there's some good peeps involved in game development there's some good gamers i'm a bit of a gamer i like having a black um but it's also notoriously misogynist um, sexist, racist, and dissociated from, from reality. Because you have these whole other alternative realities being built. And people can shut the curtains and stay in a dark room for days and days and believe that they've been living their lives, interacting with other people from within their own communities that they've built relationships with around the world. I'm not going to judge that, but, um, yeah, I don't want to judge that, but, but <laughs> look, watch me judge it. Um, no, you know, there, there is just a, there's a vulnerability there for people to become dissociated from what's going on around them in, in the actual world. And it's a form of escapism too. And when everything, you know, when everything's getting so stressful these days, we have a climate crisis, we don't know whether or not we're going to have a livable planet in the future in the, within the next couple of generations. There's, you know, massive debt and now there's COVID, you know, like the reasons to escape reality keep mounting for, particularly for our youth as well so to a degree you kind of can't blame people um, for wanting to indulge in a bit of escapism um, but then also on top of on top of um, these issues as well you had the incel culture so incel is, is an acronym of sorts you know it's shortened term for um, involuntary celibate they call themselves that. I don't, I don't get why you call yourself. I've never understood. Why would you call yourself an involuntary celibate? Like at least have the self-respect to lie and say, I don't want it anyway. But they've coined themselves involuntary celibates. But anyway, so they're people who you know, young men who are very open about the fact that they are not able to find a mate or a partner and many of them hate women because of it, because they feel hated by women. Generally socially awkward fellows and, uh, and they also live in this gaming world where you can pick up a gun and shoot whoever you want and then just turn the game off and then turn the game back on again and people are alive again. Um, and so, you know, certainly there have been a lot of mass shootings and mass killings around the world that have been traced back to incel culture. Um, and... Um, and these and these incel gaming groups and people who just blur the lines between reality um, and make believe. Now, mixed up in all of this, you also have popular culture. So you have Hollywood pumping out movies, pumping movies out around, you know, corruption and 
um, hey, you can't trust the government. I'm not going to say trust the government. I'm the last person to say trust the government. I'm also the last person to say trust the media. I'm also the last person to say um, trust science, even though I am, I'm a science I'm a scientist and a researcher as well. But, uh, you know, there are big issues around corruption, commercialising of science, commodifying of science um, that we all need to be talking about as well. Doesn't mean I'm going to go down the rabbit hole, but I do believe that those things need to be addressed. Um, and so... Hollywood was pumping out these stories that, you know, there's a kernel of truth. Every good story has a kernel of truth and then they would extend it out into uh, really interesting spaces, entertaining spaces, and that's entertainment. You know, that's entertainment. But in some cases, people started to believe that entertainment was real and you had some very convincing movies that actually played on that, like The Matrix, where they talk about you know, the red pill and the blue pill. There's not anything new, really. Like, it, like we've always told stories that kind of reflect our belief of how the world is and has these morals and allegories about what we believe is right and wrong and what a hero looks like and all of that. Um, but when, when virtual reality comes into the scene and when people start to get very blurred ideas about what's reality and not reality and then you have these cult classics like like the matrix that really get people to think about what reality even is and and um their complicitness within systems of their own oppression very clever as it turns out um the makers of the matrix have recently confirmed that it's actually about transgenderism i think that's pretty cool um so anyway you know there's this pop culture space growing as well um put that together with this hyper information um influx of of information and the information superhighway that's taken a lot of that knowledge um, you know, the control of knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge out of um, universities, libraries, books and placed it in your hand and a phone on a computer. Sometimes on your TV screen too, now we're getting to get the internet on TV. And even, you know, our public broadcasting channels that had a level of control, very few people watch television right now. Everybody's watching Netflix, YouTube, Neon, you know, or On Demand. They're choosing what they want to watch. And the content in those, on those channels, um, on those media platforms is very slick. And, you know, public broadcasting often can't compete with it. And so people, and, and, you know, and we're just, we're consuming often to escape, sometimes to inform. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll just watch what we like and what looks slick, and that's able to be manipulated. And so you have, um, where are we up to now? We have the information scape, which has hit, you know, the super highway mode. A lot more information and a lot more formats on a lot more platforms being shared and that is shooting through the roof at rates that we could never have even imagined um, and you have this real blurring of reality especially in the advent of virtual reality and games popular culture and games gaming culture and incel culture which was also you know very racist as well um, and so, um, out of these spaces, you also had a lot of message boards, chat rooms, where people would come together and, and share their ideas about the world. Um, 
within some of those spaces arose uh, the likes of 4chan and 8chan, which were the message boards largely dominated by um, racist, bigoted people, um, you know, frequented by the gaming community. Um, and this is where, you know, numerous, numerous um, mass shootings have written about what they wanted to do before they actually went out and do it did it they wrote about it on those message boards including um the case of the christchurch mosque attacks that was also um discussed and the manifesto was posted up there um and you know it, it found strong support in those spaces as well and so, you know, you, you look at the way in which um, misinformation kind of really blossomed through these channels. Um, it's, you know, even looking at that fellow that we spoke about in the last um, podcast, Bill Cooper, he really found his home with the advent of the internet. He was He was able to just hit a whole new level of spreading his misinformation um, with the advent of the internet. And so he went from, from books to to broadcasting. And so, um, and of course, Alex Jones is another person who was able to craft his own channel and get things moving in that space as well. And then, of course, you have like the spy fantasies and... As I mentioned also in that last podcast, uh, the, these, there's this running theme across many of these historical figures about having access to this top secret information. Top secret information that you could use um, to... that to and you know you'd enlighten your audience or you give them a teaser in the case of q he'd provide or she you know we, we don't know who they are provide teasers of information and then their community would like leap over it and try to interpret it Here, here's the thing also with um conspiracy theories is that they tend to exist in spaces where there's gaps of information and you're able to um, that, you know, they really rely on people's imagination, um, you know, and, and the imagination is able to take flight when you leave huge gaps. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I tend to try and encourage local councils and police and DHBs to be as transparent as possible and government to be as transparent as possible. They're contributing to the misinformation landscape um, when they leave huge gaps. I know that they can't say things that they're not clear about yet. They don't want to give their own misinformation out. Um, but there's also a lot of stuff that they could share that I I wish they would share. Um because in the absence of that information, people tend to get fanciful um, in filling the gaps. Sometimes they're just bang on correct when they fill the gaps. But certainly the risk of misinformation is higher where there's gaps. Um, where there's gaps. And so, um, yeah, there's the, this running theme of military intelligence, having top secret, secret information, passing little tidbits of information on and getting your community to you know try to make sense and interpret it and and then they'll send you information and then you become an informant and then you're a part of this amazing story and so all of these things are really seductive um seductive to to people who are looking to escape you put that together with people who are also looking 
for someone to blame for why things haven't worked out the way that they would like it to have. Uh, in the case of World War II, Hitler suggested that Germany should blame the Jews. A lot of people still do suggest that you should blame Jewish communities and anti-Semitism is still rife. Uh, these days, more often than not, people like to blame our Muslim um, Fano, Islam um, religion, and uh, and also people like to blame communities of colour. They like to blame Maori for bringing the country down, and uh, or they'll blame other communities of colour, Pacifica communities. Um, People also blame beneficiaries. Men love to blame women. Are you getting a picture? Like there's a picture of people who like to blame. Rather than understand the nuance and complexity of a situation and perhaps face their own complicitness and role in the system of injustice. That doesn't serve anybody. They'd rather blame and so, um, and especially if they feel like they can still be the hero and take us back to the good old days. And again, that's another part of this, you know, even looking at popular culture that's been, um, you know, suggested to us time and time again that there is this, um, that, that a happy ending looks like, you know, heterosexual mama and dad are 2.5 children a nice house a pleasant life and pleasant ville with a nice car and that's the happy ending and um of course that's that comes from a very specific culture stories told by very specific people um and and those are the spaces, generally, that um, those people are trying to get us back to. That's their happy ending that they want to achieve at the end of this story. So, um, yeah, I guess, you know, that is, that's, the, that's the culture that has grown over the previous few decades. This information scape that has just reached hyper speed levels of information. We've never been assaulted with information from so many angles in so many formats into the palm of our hand or the screen in front of us or the television if we want to see, uh, if we want to put it up on the television. Um, it's kind of hard to escape all of this information. It's not controlled. Um, it's not, you know, it's not supported in the way that information acquisition and ascent into enlightenment would have been. Um, and I'm not, obviously, as I've acknowledged, those, the older space, the other spaces, particularly through the industrial age, were open to corruption and bias and hierarchy themselves. Um, but what we see now is a completely different amorphous creature where... Um, people are still playing power games um, just through different through different means and different models and uh, you know the this age-old strategy of seeding distrust through misinformation and disinformation uh, is one of those strategies um, so yeah the information scape the rise of gaming culture, the dissociation from reality, coupled together with, you know, for our people with colonization as well, and a real destabilizing of our sense of identity and where we belong, and where is our people as well. And all of that was happening in the middle of all of this other stuff around the destabilizing of the idea of what is even real. Um, and, you know, and, and digital literacy, um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the podcast series as well, but within all of that, you, there are people who are 
able to be clearly manipulated um, through not being able to, you know, determine information, quality information through the internet, find and access quality information, recognize what robust and rigorous um, information checking looks like, and they can be very susceptible to being manipulated. Um, and so, and, and, you know, probably they believe that, that I'm being manipulated. Okay. But, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll continue to talk about that, um, a little bit later on, because there's some clear differences that you can make, that you can discern between a conspiracy that consists of, um, you know, decades of white supremacy and European imperialism that has lent itself to a system of power that is um, driven by self-interest and preserves power within, um, you know, older white male hands. Um and you can trace that back, and that's easily observable. You can follow the money. You can you can have a look at how this developed over time. It's been well documented and followed. It's a little bit different to saying that there's a small group of satanic pedophile, and then if you want to really extend some of the theories that are out there lizard alien underground dwelling people who are controlling everything that we see and hear or to say that the united nations is out to kill us all um you know governments are killing us through extreme negligence and through normalized racism which they like to call implicit bias, but I call it normalised racism. Um, I don't think there's anybody there actually plotting to literally kill us. Anyway, um, I'm digressing into future episodes. But that was that's our episode for today, talking about the culture. How did the culture of misinformation grow? Um you know, the pop, popular media had a huge part of it, popular culture had a huge part of it. The blurring of the lines between reality and virtual reality had a part in it. Incel and gaming culture play a huge part in it, still do play a huge part in it. Um, and the growth of the QAnon movement, where a lot of the misinformation campaigns are that we're contesting with at the moment in Aotearoa, come directly out of 4chan, 8chan, incel culture, gaming culture, um, and QAnon. You can trace many of the theories back to that. Um, okay, that's enough for us for this um, podcast episode. Uh, the next podcast episode, we are going to be looking at the Aotearoa connection. So delving a little bit deeper into um, the connections between these spaces and the Christchurch mosque attacks, um, looking at how it has manifested into theories around 1080, around 5G, around COVID, uh, the role of the New Zealand National Front, uh, and and how this connects also to New Zealand politics and the 2020 election. Uh, you've been with Tina Ngata. Big shout out to my Patreon whānau um, for supporting this content. Uh, also a shout out to um, the uh, Tweni Ngāwai whānau Trust who are very generously allowing me to use the waiata uh, te mātai rango te pākea uh, for my intro and outro. Uh, never been a more appropriate um, waiata to discuss uh, ngā tō, tō rangapū Māori, Māori politics. Kia ora everybody. Hei kōnā.